Let me start by welcoming Richard Parker from PlannerNet, one of our newest mm -hmm. members to the virtual events group. And Richard, you've been doing this for a long time, and I'd love you to tell our audience exactly what you've been doing in your own words. Good morning, Robin. Appreciate you having us here today. Um, by us, I mean my, both myself and uh, Sasha Smith, our COO, who will uh, enlighten us on a lot more information than, uh, than I probably know, the detail of the company, how it operates. Um, so I'm looking forward to her also participating. Um, to answer your question, yes, PlannerNet's been around for a long time. We've been doing this since I think 1989, over 30 years, which is uh, which is a great run for a company, and we're still doing fantastic. Um, 30 years ago, I have no idea how people did this. I wouldn't have wanted been around doing it. Phone calls, uh, who knows, faxes, pay phones, however you got in touch with people. Um, in today's world, obviously, we leverage technology. However, we're not just a uh, technology-based company. Um, you know, we're not just a marketplace that's just out there, um, kind of leaving it to you to do it yourself and taking a profit off the top. We kind of, we take technology and we wrap a whole customer service delivery team around what we do. And that customer service delivery team really allows you to, you know, get the right talent at the right time and know that you're getting good people. And I guess what I should have done for your community was explain PlannerNet first. And what we do is we connect talent with, um, with businesses that need it. Um, it's all meeting and event professionals. So most of what we do is connect them with meeting and event agencies as well as internal departments. Um, so that's, that's PlannerNet in a nutshell. And I appreciate you having us here and uh, hopefully connecting with some of your community in the near future. Thank you. So let's just say I'm in North Carolina. I'm planning an event. I am short staffed. And that's yep. when I turn to you, right? Yes, exactly. And so on the flip side, tell us about the typical workers. We have professional meeting and event planners and they want to show up at events. They want to work events ahead of time. So we have 3,500 of them roughly. I mean, the number is always swaying, you know, de depends who's doing what. It's very much a niche, but needed by the whole community, you know? And so you've got on one side, you've got your event planners. And on the other side, you've got people who need help with their events. And you get, you get all these freelancers based on their skills, right? And you also, if I'm not mistaken, take care of a lot of the laborious stuff that many freelancers despise. Yes. So, hi, Robin. You know, similar to your company, it's really B2B. Our network, they're all small businesses, every single one of them. And we are really matching them and aligning them to large organizations and bringing them work that would be difficult for them to get on their own otherwise. And so we do have a network of 3,500 people. It's growing really rapidly. There's a big influx of people who want to work more independently. That's a byproduct, I think. I think it was always moving in that direction, but the byproduct of the pandemic. But we have a growing network of suppliers who are really actively looking to pick who they work with and pick the variety of work that they are supporting. And we kind of sit in the middle of that. And we work with you know, the full array of customers that are planning meetings and we sort of meet them where they are with whatever they need as far as meeting an event. I think during the pandemic, they kind of woke up, got a little tired, well, couldn't travel and now are just happy to work where they are and you help facilitate that. Is that? Agree. And if you can really imagine, I mean, Rich and I talk about this all the time, you know, obviously our industry where it was so decimated during that time. And so people really got creative, which is the great part of where we are now. People have started their own businesses. They may still be working full time, but they're also running businesses on the side and staying networked in the industry and upskilling and learning new skills so that they can stay ahead of what's coming next. And we kind of get to play in the middle of that and help align people and organizations. And then by playing in the middle, you take care of a lot of their headaches. So, so You've got customer success people, I'm sure, who work very closely. In our pre-call, you talked about, you know, the environment and how nice it is to have local people on the ground near your event rather than spread out and flying in from all over the place and the impact of that 
on the environment. It, do, are you seeing that, that you can staff locally, if you will? Well, we always have. We've always gone after the local proposition. The industry has not gotten there consistently. We are working hard towards that. Sustainability is definitely becoming a bigger and bigger issue. So we are, I, I feel like our local network is a huge part of the value. We do our own calculator for clients to let them know their impact when they're flying people in, not awesome. using local. So it's a, it's definitely an interesting concept. He says, I don't think people consider labor necessarily part of how you can have a sustainable action. I think we look at you know, where's our food coming from at events? How are we recycling at events? What are our hotels doing for us? But I think labor is the added component that people could get creative with. That is, instead of sending, you know, 45 of my entire team, I could send half my team and get half locally. And they they know the venues and I've reduced travel costs and I've, I've chosen a more sustainable solution. So you don't have to go all in, but you could take these little incremental baby steps with labor even to help make your event more sustainable. So you were really sort of had a long vision about this. I mean, you know, it, it, the world has changed. There are more freelancers than ever before. There are more and 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 happy freelancers, you know, to be to have their own hours, to raise their families and still have super meaningful work careers. And I think, you know, talk about, you know, some of so I'm going to. I'm planning an event. What's the question you get asked most often? It's like, help, I don't know where to start or help, I'm looking for specific functions filled. I think customers come in a, in a variety of different ways. I think sometimes it is, hey, I'm having an event in Texas. I don't have anybody you know, who can help support. Can you give me talent that can run breakout rooms and manage registration and help me set up before the event? And we'll help source that labor, procure that labor for them. Sometimes, though, it's a customer coming to us saying, hey, we're going to run you know, a product launch next year across the U.S. And we want to build a talent pool that travels with the programs because we want the same talent at every meeting. Can you help us? Can you recruit and find those, those businesses to support us? And you know, I use this phrase, Rich and I use it all the time. But again, we're meeting people where they are with whatever they need. And the great thing about 3,500 small businesses is... They can adapt and mold to fit whatever model is needed for each organization. Everybody needs something a little different. And so when you vet your freelancers, you know their skills. It's just like how you would vet any, you know, B2B partnership or strategic partnership. When they come on board, you're vetting like how valid are you as a business? What work product have you put out there in the past five years? What references do you have in the industry? What customers have you worked with in the last 10 years? And so we have a dedicated team that is kind of working through that process. And also trying to understand from our suppliers, like, where are you trying to go? What customers do you want to work with? What cultures do you want to be aligned your business to? What skills are you trying to acquire and support moving forward? And so we do, we have a database and we we have all of this information stored. And then we kind of have a secondary vetting that as they partner with customers in the industry, we get that feedback too. And so, you know, we have essentially this you know, world of knowledge about these businesses and we can better align people because, you know, it is at the end of the day, people at events. And so it's a people world and we have to make sure that we get both the hard skills and soft skills. So you get the whole gamut of of people looking for your services? Yeah, we work with large agencies, travel agencies, meeting and event agencies, a lot of direct corporate, you know, Fortune 500. And then a lot of small companies that, you know, they were trying to do it themselves. They knew whoever in the local market and they're gone. And so they need somebody and they come to us. So what have you seen in the big changes in the in the post pandemic? Has your landscape changed from before? No, it's it's coming back. Um, we will be bigger than 2019. Right now, we are blowing away numbers. Live meetings are back and running. Virtual still there. It's It won't go away. It's going to be part of the landscape going on forever. But people are here and they're, they're, they want live meetings. But it's it's a little different. And, and so we've talk, I've talked about this. And what struck me about both of you is not just that you run this service, but you are committed to a, a healthy freelance economy, which is 
I think, definitely changed. And you know how many people stepped away. There were no live events. And and that you have really built an ethos around the company of making sure that freelancers are treated by the law, um, that they're taking full advantage. And so, you know, talk to me about some of the things that are changing to accommodate this seismic shift. So the uh, the future of work, it, it's here. It was here five years ago. Freelancers were climbing. I think in our space, it has definitely climbed even more. But if you talk about it in general, 60 million people in the U.S. are freelancing, whether full-time job or partial work or whatever they're doing. It's just, it's the reality of work. The states, the feds, everybody's got to come along and understand that it's not going to be employer employee relationship going forward. I think the freelancers need, and there are a couple of companies out there, they need their benefits, all of that. I believe in the economy and where it's going. The macro economy is going freelance. It's not even a question. People want flexibility. They want to enjoy what they do. They want to choose who they want to work with. And this is what we do. We play in the middle and we connect them. You know, it, it sort of ties to what you said before, Robin. You know, the pandemic, we saw what it did to the labor market, right? People either went into early retirement or they lost their jobs for a period of time or they had to leave their jobs to be caretakers, whatever the reason. It, I think, expedited the need for freelance, whether that be I need agency over my schedule and what I do and what I want to do in the next you know phase of my career. Or, hey, I'm an organization and I still have to produce events and I don't have my, my team anymore. And so I have to have some talent into my company. And so I think what we've seen is a little bit of this renaissance going on where customers are, are embracing freelance in a different way. And they're seeing that yeah. they can come in and you're going to need your full-time team always. But your freelancers are also critical to that and they can give flexibility to your own team. They don't have to go to every meeting. I think that's I think that's where we are now is how do you do that? For one, I think companies are trying to figure that out. How do you do it compliantly, which I think is where you're kind of going. It's a big burden. I, they're planning big events. Do they really want to also have to manage how do I find my, you know, talent, my freelance talent? How do I make sure I'm engaging them legally? What paperwork do I have on them to prove that I'm engaging them legally? How am I paying them well? And so that's where we've kind of come into companies and said, don't worry about that piece. Outsource that to us. We'll take with our technology. We'll give you a really easy way to engage the talent. You tell us what you need, where where you need people, what what you're trying to accomplish with your freelance talent. And then we'll cultivate a, a freelance talent pool for you. And then on the other flip side, you know, we're working with businesses to say, that's the company you want to work with? Great. They're looking for these skill sets. Do you have them? If not, go get them. How do we align you? And so I think we're sitting in that middle. And then as, you know, Rich was kind of intimating is we've been looking at compliance for the past seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. It's not new. It's heating up more than ever. We, we really look at it black and white as employees and employers, but there is 60 million people who want to work in this capacity. And so we have to make sure we engage them appropriately. And you are right. You know, staffing organizations have been around for a long time, but yours is is totally specialty. So so just so our audience knows, so it, are you mostly in the sweet spot where you want somebody to take over and plan the event? Or can I call you and say, I need a musician, a balloon blower, a ticket taker? Like where where in that spectrum do is Planner Net's sweet spot? I mean, we say we're in meeting and events, and so it's not just any element of labor at meeting and events. It really is in the pre-planning of events, you know, virtual event registration, management, virtual producers, audiovisual technicians. So really more in the people who execute events, not in the ancillary talent that may come to an event. You feel that events and meetings in particular are great thing to think about outsourcing for any company. So you're sort of perfectly positioned at this moment. Yeah, it's it's good and sad to say that based on what happened the last three years. But, you know, fortunately, our model works with an upswing in the economy 
and a downswing in the economy. It's just where we play, you know, I don't want to capitalize on the fact that a lot of people lost a lot of jobs, but yeah, we, it's, it's where we play and we bring opportunity to small businesses. I mean, that's our mission statement and, and I love it. That's what we do. You know, I yeah, know, I a positive to this though, Roman. I actually think a lot of people were toying with the idea of, you know, I'm talented, I can go run my business, but I'm not quite sure how to just take the lead. And I, I think while the last few years have been difficult, I think a lot of people made that jump and are happier than ever. I mean, Rich and I were talking, we've seen numbers of people asking to join our network more aggressive than ever within the last two months yeah. at, a pace, at a pace that we were just absolutely not expecting. And I, I just think this is like we said, it's the trend. Yeah. It's where people are trying to go. It yeah. plays into every sentiment. So now I have to ask you about oh. affordability. <laughs> Am I adding to the ticket price of an event by you as, if you will, the middleman and talk to me about how much an event costs? Yes, there is a cost. Um, we are providing a service and technology. However, that cost and the way we've looked at it and most of our clients that fully subscribe to what we do is it's an offset with the program manager labor. Um, you can imagine the amount of time and effort program managers take trying to find somebody, ensure they're vetted, they're going to show up, they know what they're doing. Um, so we've already done all of that. We have a whole supplier network team. They ensure that our 3,500 suppliers are valid. Um, they're small businesses. This is what they want to do. Um, our technology makes things very efficient. So turnaround time is quick. And we take all of that off the program manager's plate. You know, the other thing we do is we, we absorb hidden costs in a company. Um, companies obviously have HR, finance, legal, whether legal's in-house or outsourced. And we take the time that they usually would have to spend supporting program managers, and we absorb that as well. Um, it's not usually understood because you already have those departments, um, but I will tell you finance is one of our, one of our biggest fans. Um, they love what we do. We take the process off their plate, all of the payments, 1099s, um, W-9s, any other information that's needed. Um, because, you know, we, we don't do this in Excel. We leverage our portal for program managers to request quickly and efficiently. We have a freelance management system behind the whole thing that's running the connection of the meeting program managers or meeting planners and program managers with our network. Um, and then we leverage uh, electronic payment. Uh, and we do pay our folks in 30 days. Uh, you can imagine the hassle in larger companies of trying to get a payment out in 30 days. So we've had clients do their own analysis um, when they're making their decision to come to PlannerNet. And really, they've looked at the whole thing and seen an offset. And they realize what they should do is let PlannerNet be an outsourced provider of these meeting and event professionals, um, as well as let them focus on what they do best, which is planning meetings, um, creating experiences for audiences, and don't waste their time trying to do what we're set up to do. You know, they're meeting planning companies and we're outsourced procurement of small businesses. Our mission is to bring some uh, large opportunities to small businesses. And that's what we do. And back to your question, yes, the cost is there, but it's offset. And I guess the final thing I'd really want to bring up is the, the really hidden cost of non-compliance. Um, nobody thinks about it until they get a letter from the DOL or the IRS or one of the states or a locality. Um, and once you get one of those letters about whether the independent contractor um, is an employee or an independent contractor, which I will tell you from our experience, meeting planners cannot be independent contractors for a meeting and event company. They're doing the same thing as your employees. Um, so when that letter comes, Everybody gets nervous. There's a lot of cost behind it. You've got to respond. You've got to pull data. You go into questionnaires and questions and meetings, and hopefully you're not deposed or in front of an administrative judge. And then the ultimately is penalties and fines are just up in the millions. Um, so, you know, I look at it as the cost of planner net offsets the business cost. Um, and really, once you understand that and can see it, you see the true value. And then we also take away this whole hidden thing 
that can just blow up on your company out of nowhere. Um, so that's, you know, we're running a business, it's for profit. And uh, I think, you know, that we bring a lot of value to companies. There's, there's two parts that we do a little bit logistically is a lot of customers come, in, come to us and say, hey, I know that I want a travel director for, you know, the next five days and I pay my TDs $500 a day plus, a, you know, whatever an expense reimbursement, we'll take that on and we'll price, we'll price ourselves, you know, as a, as a partnership fee on top. So like there's a lot of customers who come with a price structure already in mind. And as Rich mentioned, we find a way to navigate that. You've been wonderful in explaining you know, where you fit into the events ecosystem. Is there anything that we should be telling our members to be thinking about as they look for services like yours? So I would say the future of work is here. The matching of labor and not full-time employees is here. Try to figure out the new way forward. Understand the economy and the macro economy are changing and people want to be freelancers. People want to use that. So I feel like for your members in the meeting and event space, just be open, open to where things are going here. It's here. It's not going to change. Genie's yeah. out of the bottle, you know? And I, and I think you're a great resource for our entire community on, on how this plays out. Sasha, I see you nodding your head. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I echo the same sentiment. I think after the last three years, change can feel hard, yeah. especially when we're all running at a clip to try to get events back at the rate they were. But I think if people can embrace the freelance economy in a way to know that it can mold to fit your organization and support your entire workforce, including your employees, you know, I think that's my, my biggest sentiment is just stay open-minded and if the pains that you're feeling, I think a freelance workforce can help supplement and reduce some of that. Burden. I hope that you will do to be a part of the veg community, contributing your ideas because you have a unique set of skills together that can really help us during this great transition period. Look forward to seeing you and we'll see you online always and often. So thank you for your time today.